that you're here, whether you're here or online uh, tonight for our Bible study. Uh, we will go over our prayer list at the end of service since we're on the live stream. You folks that are there, remember to get those prayer requests in as quickly as you can. I uh, also remind you, I sent out a message today for those that could be here. The nominate committee needs to meet just for a few minutes right after service. We'll meet right back here uh, for just a few minutes. Um, before we pray and then get into our study, I want to share with you, uh, get this magazine however often on mission and about the only thing I ever read is a little section called The Pulse because it has some interesting little things in it and there were several I wanted to share with you tonight. On average, 95% of a given college campus is unreached. Not, not just lost, no, nobody doing anything to reach them. This one's called Eternal Uncertainty. 45% of Americans say they wonder if they would go to heaven when they die. 37% say they never think about that. And 18% aren't sure. That's a lot of people that don't know whether they're going to go to heaven or not. And then, then this I found very interesting. Uh, this is entitled, Here to Help. 53% of Americans say churches in their community have been helpful during the coronavirus pandemic with 27% saying congregations were very helpful. And then this one, and this is for you that are running our, our live stream tonight, almost half of Americans watched a church service online during the pandemic. 15% of those who watched an online service did not regularly attend church prior to the pandemic. Now, I thought that was kind of interesting that maybe we reached 15% people that never uh, attended a service before all of this. So, hope you found that interesting. We'll pray and get into our Bible study tonight. Most gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for being our God. We thank you for this privilege you've given us tonight to gather around your word. And Lord, we just pray that you'd speak to us, that you'd accomplish your purposes here in this place, in our lives this night. And we ask this in the precious name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Call your attention to the book of Jeremiah chapter 8. We'll be looking at all 22 verses tonight. Jeremiah chapter 8 verses 1 through 22. And I'll begin reading to you at verse 1. At that time, says the Lord, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah and the bones of its princes, and the bones of the priest, and the bones of the prophets, and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves. They shall spread them before the sun and the moon, and all the host of heaven which they have loved, and which they have served, and after which they have walked, which they have sought, and which they have worshipped. They shall not be gathered nor buried, they shall be like refuse on the face of the earth. Then death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue of those who remain of this evil family, who remain in all the places where I have driven them, says the Lord of hosts. Moreover, you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, will they fall and not rise? Will one turn away and not return? Why has this people slidden back? Jerusalem in a perpetual backsliding, they hold fast to deceit, they refuse to return. I listened and heard, but they do not speak or write. No man repented of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his own course as the horse rushes into the battle. Even the stork in the heavens knows her appointed times, and the turtle dove, the swift, and the swallow observe the time of their coming, but my people do not know the judgment of of the Lord. How can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Look, the false pen of the scribes certainly works falsehood. The wise men are ashamed, they are dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord, so what wisdom do they have? Therefore, I will give their wives to others and their fields for those who will inherit, will inherit them, because from the least even to the greatest, Everyone is given to covetousness, from the prophet even to the priest, 
Everyone deals falsely, for they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. <clears throat> Therefore they shall fall among those who fall. In the time of their punishment they shall be cast down, says the Lord. I will surely consume them, says the Lord. No grape shall be on the vine, <clears throat> no figs on the fig tree, and the leaves shall fade. And the things I have given them shall pass away from them. Why do we sit still, assemble yourselves, and let us enter the fortified cities, and let us be silent there? For the Lord our God has put us to silence and given us water of gall to drink, because we have sinned against the Lord." We looked for peace, but no good came. And for a time of health, and there was trouble. The snorting of his horses was heard from Dan. The whole land trembled at the sound of the neighing of his strong ones. For they have come and devoured the land and all that is in it, the city and those who dwell in it. For behold, I will send serpents among you, vipers, which cannot be charmed, and they shall bite you, says the Lord. I would comfort myself in sorrow, my heart is faint in me. Listen, the voice, the cry of the daughter of my people from a far country. Is not the Lord in Zion? Is not her king in her? <coughs> Why have they provoked me to anger with their carved images, with foreign idols? The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the hurt of the daughter of my people, I am hurt. <coughs> I am mourning. Astonishment has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is there no recovery for the health of the daughter of my people? <coughs> May the Lord bless the reading and receiving of his word tonight. We have mentioned, I'm sure already, in this study that Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. You have probably wondered where in the world did all of that come from? from when we've looked at these first seven chapters. Hadn't been any weeping there, unfortunate, unfortunately, really. <clears throat> God's people ought to have been weeping, but they weren't. And so you probably wonder, well, when, we're going, when are we going to see this fact of him being the weeping prophet? prophet? Well, in chapter 9, you really <clears throat> get a vision of that, but you get a glimpse of it here <clears throat> in chapter 8. Before we see the glimpse, though, the Lord speaks, and then we will listen to the lament. So it's the Lord and the lament tonight, and we begin in verses 1 through 3 with the Lord speaking to the people. <clears throat> the Lord speaking to the people. Verses 1 through 3 are very interesting. They're kind of a continuation of some of what we saw in chapter 7. And when the Lord speaks here, what he does is to tell these people what the Babylonians are going to do. Remember, uh, th there's already been some consideration of the Assyrians. But God says to them, the Assyrians are not going to take you into captivity. But the Babylonians were. And so now, here in verses 1 through 3, he's going to talk to them about what is going to happen. First of all, when these Babylonians came into <coughs> Judah and Jerusalem, he tells them what they would do with the bones of people already dead. Now, it's kind of interesting. All along as God's people deal with these enemies around them, everybody that they've had to deal with seems to get worse and worse. So when these Babylonians come, they're going to be worse than the Assyrians. They're not just going to torment them. They're going to dig up the bones of those who are already dead. They will, the, the Bible says here they will bring out the bones of those who were dead. And they, the, the Lord here specifies whose bones are going to be dug up. He, he will bring out the bones of the kings, the princes, the priests, the prophets, and then others who were inhabitants of Jerusalem. The, the idea expressed is that when they come among you, they're not going to just come among you. They're going to come to desecrate and humiliate. 
And it's not just enough to humiliate you. They're going to dig up the bones of those who have been before. Now listen to this. This is kind of interesting. <clears throat> We've talked about this. We go back a hundred years. And Isaiah was talking to these people about repenting or judgment is going to come. And now we've come to Jeremiah and we're asking, is it too late because judgment is about to befall them? And when that judgment comes, these Babylonians are going to come among them and listen to this, they're going to dig up bones of those kings who would not hear God. They're going to dig up those bones of those priests who did not honor God. They're going to dig up the bones of the princes who did not honor God, of the prophets who, maybe the, the idea here is those false prophets who've been speaking not for God, but whatever man wanted to hear. And then those other people of Jerusalem who would not honor God. Their bones are going to be dragged out um, of the graves and, and displayed. And then... He tells them not only what the Babylonians would do with the bones, he tells them what they would do about the burial. Look at verse 2. They shall spread them before the sun and the moon and all the host of heaven, which they have loved and which they have served and after which they have walked, which they have sought, which they have worshipped. <clears throat> they shall not be gathered nor buried. They shall be like refuse on the face of the earth. Why? They're, they're going to display these bones. And he tells us in verse 2 here why they would display them. He said they're going to bring them out before the sun, the moon, all the host of heaven, which they have loved. He's not talking there about the Babylonians. All these kings and princes and priests and prophets are going to have their bones laid out under the sun and the moon and all the host of heaven because when they were living, they were worshiping these things. They loved these things. And then he tells us when they would be buried. They won't. They won't be buried. They, they were going to drag out these bones, lay them out, and they would not bury them. And then we're told here why they would leave them. He said, they shall, shall be like the refuse on the face of the earth. Dung, waste. That's what those bones will be like. And the Babylonians would not do anything to bury them. They'll dig them up. They're not putting them back. And then he told what the Babylonians would do to the balance. The balance. Listen to this. Then death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue of those who remain of this evil family, who remain in all the places where I have driven them, says the Lord of hosts. The Babylonians would create such a situation with what he says here is the residue. That's, uh, that's where I get the word balance from. That that's left over of the people in that place. They would do to them such that they would come to the place they would rather die than have life. They, they will choose death over life. You know what? It's kind of fascinating sometimes to me to watch and to see what people will do to live. We'll go all, through all kinds of things fighting for life, right? But they come to the place, they'd rather just die than to fight for life. And then they're going to be driven away by God. He said, then death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue of those who remain of this evil family, who remain in all the places where I have driven them, says the Lord of hosts. That, there are two things probably here uh, meant by that when it says they'll be driven away. The Babylonians will do it, but they're operating by the, by the authority of God. In, in driven into all these places, no doubt we know they're going into captivity. We haven't seen too much of this yet, but the reality is that not all of them are going away to Babylon. Some of them are going to go to Egypt. As a matter of fact, Jeremiah himself, who is going to protest a whole lot about that, is going to end up going to Egypt as well with some of those who are left behind. So the reality is they're all going to be driven away. Some into captivity in Babylon and some into Egypt. So the Lord speaks to the people. In verses 1 through 3, 
But then in verses 4 through 17, the Lord speaks to the prophet. Now, here, here's the interesting thing about that. If Here in these first three verses, it is as if God is speaking directly to them. Now he's going to speak to the prophet, but why do you think he's going to do that? For him to speak to the people. So it seems to be in verses 1 through 3 more directly, but now we're hearing what he's going to talk to Jeremiah about that he might share with the people. First of all, he, he is to ask, God tells Jeremiah, he is to ask about their fall. Listen to this. He said, Moreover you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord, Why they fall? will they fall and not rise? Will one turn away and not return? Why has this people slidden back Jerusalem in a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. You know, you know really what he does there? Or what he tells Jeremiah to do? Ask them, Why, why have they sinned? No, I guess not just why you've sinned, but ask them why they just keep on in sin, keep on backsliding. You know what? It's a really interesting question. Have you ever asked it of yourself? Something happens and you sin, and why did I do that? And so Jeremiah really says, or God really says to him, ask them, why? Why are you sinning? And then another interesting thing he asked them, why have you spoken? Look at verse 6. I listened and heard. This is God speaking to Jeremiah. And he said, I listened and I heard, but they do not speak aright. No man repented of his wickedness, saying, what have I done? Everyone turned to his own course as the horse rushes into the battle. Not only why have you sinned, but why have you spoken the way you have? Listen, if during Jeremiah's day, God heard what they said, do you think anything's changed today? God hears us, folks. And I hope he rejoices over what he hears. But I'll point out to you that he said to them, they do not speak aright. They're not saying what is right. Now listen, the reality is, and we're going to see a little bit later on, one of the keys here for kind of understanding this as we come to it, but the reality is that everything that's said can't be right. Listen, we're living in a day in which everybody's contradicting everybody. And I, I just hate to remind you of this, but when you come to that place, somebody's got to be wrong. And, and to hear it told, I can't be everywhere, so I don't know everything, but I hear a lot of things. And if you believe the half of what you're told, we've got people right in this place, standing in the pulpit, and praise the Lord for this, some of them are proclaiming what God says. And we have come to the place in which the scriptures talk about where we have others who seem to be tickling ears and saying what people want to hear. Now, both those things can't be right. He said, you do not speak aright. He, he, he tells Jeremiah, ask him about their fall. Why is it you, you sinned? And why is it you're saying these things? And then he tells Jeremiah something else in verses 7 through 9. He tells him that he, that is Jeremiah, is to agree with their foolishness. Now let me explain to you what I mean by that. God's going to tell them that they're being foolish. And really I think he's saying to Jeremiah, and you need to be in agreement with that, that they are foolish. Notice here how God says they're foolish. Verse 7, he said, Even the stork in the heavens knows her appointed times. And the turtle dove, the swift and the swallow, observe the time of their coming. But my people do not know the judgment of the Lord. You, you can kind of sum this up. What he says is this. Look at the birds. They know the time of things, right? I happened to look out in the yard the other day. I think it's a little early, but what I know. And I looked out in the yard and there were two fat robins out there bouncing around. I hadn't seen a robin in a while. We, I've seen birds around. 
but it's been a while since I've seen a robin. You know what that kind of suggests to me? Spring's on the way. Watch the birds. A lot of, a lot of places, you, you remember our Lord teaching talked about this, to consider the sparrows and, and, and the birds of the air. So the reality is, He, he said this of them, and he, he does so in this place, they've got enough knowledge to know when it's time to go south and when it's time to come back. The appointed times. They build nests and lay eggs and all those things at the appointed times. And then he says this, but my people do not know the judgment of the Lord. Remember the question we're asking here. Is it too late? Let me tell you something. For these folks, it was late. A hundred years before, we've already said it tonight, Isaiah was already prophesying to them. And a hundred years later, they haven't figured this out. God says they're foolish. And then again, God knows what they say. Listen to this. He says, tells Jeremiah to say to them, How can you say we are wise? That's what these people were saying. We are wise. What do people say today? I, I would suggest to you that you, we have never lived in a time when more people were proclaiming their own wisdom. You know honestly what the problem is with that? God Himself has really already defined what wisdom is. And most of these folks that are proclaiming their own wisdom don't give any indication that they know anything about how God has defined that. And then listen. He said, how can you say we're wise? And the law of the Lord is with us. They were saying that as well. Look, the false pen of the scribes certainly works falsehood. God knows what they say. We're wise and we, the law of the Lord is with us. And yet he said the false pen of the scribe was working falsehood. What you call the law of the Lord is not. And then listen to this. This is really, this really in, in essence, what their foolishness boils down to. Not only does God say they're foolish and God knows what they say, God knows they have rejected his word. Listen to verse 9. The wise men are ashamed, they are dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom do they have? He knew that they had rejected his word. And he said, so where's their wisdom? If, you, if you've rejected my word, where's your wisdom? J. Vernon McGee said this, he said, their crowning sin is that they are rejecting the word of the Lord. That had been all right if McGee had stopped right there. But then he added this, this is the crowning sin of America also. He is to ask about their fall. He is to agree, agree with what God said about their foolishness. But then in verses 10 through 17, he is to announce about their fate. Now, fate's kind of an interesting word. It really, as Christians, we don't use that much. But the reality is that here, their fate was what was going to befall them. And you just as well to use that word because they'd brought it on themselves. This is kind of what they've been pushing for. They didn't see things God's way. And he tells them, first of all, what will be taken from them. Therefore, I will give their wives to others and their fields to those who will inherit them. Because from the least, uh, uh, even to the greatest, everyone is given to covetousness. And then in verse 13, he said, I will surely consume them, says the Lord. No grapes shall be on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree. And the leaf shall fade, and the things I have given them shall pass away from them. It's all going away. It's going to be taken from them. The reality is, all of this was at the hand of God. It was God's blessings upon them. They, turned, they believed that. They were taught that. And they turned their back on God and he said, all of it will be taken from you. Also in verses 10 through 12, he tells them why this will be taken from them. Because from the least even to the greatest, everyone is given to covetousness. From the prophet even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. 
for they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination, though they were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. Therefore they shall fall among those who fall in the time of their punishment. They shall be cast down, says the Lord. He, he said, first of all, covetousness. Why is all this going to be taken away from you? Covetousness. I, I think just recently I heard somebody say that really the, the, the sin that led to more sin was the sin of covetousness. It, you're covetous and then it, it just goes on from there. He talks about them speaking falsely. And then you have verses 11 through 12. That sound familiar? Turn back a couple of chapters. But let me remind you of this when we came to chapter 7. What did I tell you? We went ahead about five years in time. So in five years of time, God says again to these people, these really almost exactly the same words, for they had healed the hurt of the daughter of my people, saying slightly, saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. The, the false prophet just continued to say, oh, there's going to be peace. There's going to be peace. And then he talks again about their, their shame. When they committed abomination, they were not ashamed. They did not blush. Again, almost exactly the same words he had said five years earlier. And then we hear, hear what the people say about all of this. Verses 14 through 16 to me are kind of God anticipating what they would say. Why do we sit still, assemble yourselves, and let us enter the fortified cities and let us be silent there. For the Lord our God has put us to silence and given us water of gall to drink because we have sinned against the Lord. We looked for peace, but no good came, and for a time of health, and there was trouble. The snorting of horses was heard from Dan. The whole land trembled at the sound of, ne of the neighing of his strong ones, for they have come and devoured the land and all that is in it, the city and those who dwell in it. Now, let me just remind you of this, that, that all of that hadn't happened yet. But God's anticipating what hopefully some of them are going to be saying, let's Let's go into the fortified city and let's, let's see this. Is God giving us gall to drink because we have sinned against the Lord? And, and they're kind of describing what was going to happen to them uh, in that day. And God's anticipating that as he speaks with, through the prophet here, as he speaks to Jeremiah uh, here about their fate and what would happen to them. And then he tells them again, verse 17, what will be done to them for behold, I will send serpents among you, vipers which cannot be charmed, and they shall bite you, says the Lord. Now, we just saw, what, a couple of Sundays ago, a picture, I didn't tell you this then, because I'm going to in the next chapter, which will be this Sunday, but that actually is a picture of the millennium. But we just saw the people, even children, and snakes not biting them. But he says of them, I will send serpents among you, vipers which cannot be charmed, and they shall bite you, says the Lord. Now, uh, there, there are those who debate whether that was literal snakes or whether, again, it was the Babylonians he, would, he was describing who could not be charmed and stopped. But either way, uh, that that awaited them was going to be horrible, was going to be horrible. Well, we talked about lament, and I said to you, we'll, we'll get into it tonight, really get into it in chapter 9. But in verses 18 through 22, you have... Jeremiah's lament. If I remember correctly, this is the first one of his lament. He, he did a whole lot of lamenting. I, I guess one of the reasons he did a whole lot is that the people wouldn't do it. And so much so that we even know that there's another book by him, Lamentations, so in which he recorded a great deal of lament. Notice, first of all, as the Lord speaks through the prophet here. So the Lord speaking through him, what Jeremiah is experiencing is a part of the message. And, and first of all, in verses 18 through 19, you see his lament about the captivity. He said, I would comfort myself in sorrow. My heart is faint in me. Listen, the voice, the cry of the daughter of my people from a far country is not the Lord in Zion, is not her king in her. Why have they provoked me to anger with their carved images with foreign idols. Verse 18, you kind of begin to see what Jeremiah felt. Now, I, I don't know how you take this and what you think about this, but you know, I, I imagine this couldn't be an easy thing for Jeremiah. Uh, not just in the position of going to his people and kind of saying, hey, it's too late. 
in, in a sense. And so he said, I would comfort myself in my sorrow. My heart is faint in me. He, that, that's a really good introduction to what he's going to say in chapter 9. Really, he's really going to express himself in chapter 9 about how, uh, how he feels about what is happening to his people. And then in verse 19, he, you hear here not only what he felt, but what he heard. He said, listen. So he's hearing something. The voice, the cry of the daughter of my people from a far country. What's going to happen? These people are going into captivity. They're, they're going to be carried away to a foreign land, to a, a place far, far away from their homeland. And he laments here, is, is not the Lord in Zion? Is not the king in her? They're all gone. He even, he even viewed this as the Lord is gone. I mean, it's, it's just all gone from Zion. And then he, he, he talked about something else he saw here. And that, that maybe this is most painful of all because he saw why this was happening. Why have they provoked me to anger with their carved images with foreign idols? And again, he's speaking for the Lord here. But he, he's seeing that these people will not see why this is happening to them or getting ready to. But he saw it. Why have they provoked me to anger? God's people had provoked him with their carved images and their foreign idols. And now he laments over their captivity. He also laments over the cause over the cause of this, why have they provoked me to anger with their carved images with foreign idols? There's the declaration really of the Lord there of the whole cause of this. And, and Jeremiah's lamenting that cause that, that this has happened because of, of what the people have done and because they refuse to hear the Lord. And then there is deliverance by the Lord. Verse 20, the harvest is past, the summer is ended. And we are not saved. The summer is past, he said. The, 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 the harvest is past. The summer is ended. What, what he says there is this. The, all of that's happened and deliverance hasn't come. But then listen to that next statement. And we are not saved. It not only has not come, it will not come. Now listen, we can look at that and say, my, that's harsh. Boy, that's, that's bad. Let me tell you this and remind you of this. He had delivered them over and over and over again. In, in this case, while deliverance had not come prior to this, He had sent His Word to them over and over and over again. Repent. And now not only has it not come, it's not going to come. Listen, in a whole lot of ways, I feel like we sort of stand in a place like that today. Where we're at today. God sent His Son, gave His Son to die on Calvary's tree for the sins of the world. Since that time, the gospel has been preached. The gospel has been proclaimed. and People have been saved. Certainly people have rejected, but many have been saved, but the days move along, and it seems like it, sometimes even among God's people, we're becoming more and more hardened to that, more and more unresponsive to the reality that one gave his life for our sins. <clears throat> the fact is that God says this, we're living in an age of grace, and whosoever will may come. Salvation is available, it's available freely, it is available to all. But I want to remind you, Scripture indicates to us this, one of these days it will no longer be available. Is it too late? At some point it will be. At some point it will be. So he laments here the cause, but then he laments for the cure. For the cure, verses 21 through 22. For the hurt of the daughter of my people, I am hurt. I am mourning. Astonishment has taken hold of me. 
he talks first of all there about how he mourned. For the hurt of the daughter of my people, I am hurt. Jeremiah takes this personally. I, I would remind you again, we, we got a few chapters to go yet, but he's going to take it so personally, he's going to say to God, I'm not going to speak for you anymore. You deceive me, and I, I'm not going to deliver these messages anymore. Why? Why did he say that, and why does he say this? Jeremiah saw what was happening. Jeremiah knows what was happening, but he still loves his people. He still loves them in spite of everything. How about Paul? Remember Paul writing to the Romans, he said this. He said, if my brethren, according to the flesh, would, would be saved, I would consider myself accursed if that would do it. My, what love Jeremiah had for his people. What love Paul had for his people. Let me just remind you of this. Sin, whether it's in our lives or their lives, is an awful thing. It's a nasty thing. It's a dirty thing. And we ought to hate it with every part of our being. We ought to love those people. We ought to love those people. Listen, we ought to mourn over those people. Just like Jeremiah mourned over his people, we ought to be mourning over lost people today. And then notice he mentions several things after that mourning. First of all, he mentions this idea of is there no comfort? He said, is there no balm in Gilead? That's kind of a familiar phrase that he um, used here. Is there no balm in Gilead? The idea really expressed the balm would, there's some injury, some cut, whatever. A balm would... Uh, would soothe it would comfort so he said is there no comfort is there no comfort well comfort oftentimes comes from a comforter so he also asked is there no physician there not only is there no comfort is there no one to bring comfort and then really at the heart of it he asked is there no cure why then is there no recovery for the health of the daughter of my people? We all know this. We've had some experience, whether it's personal or I mean, you or someone you knew. You know what it is to come to that place where they say there's no cure. There's just nothing else to be done. <clears throat> That's a sad time, is it not? When for a loved one, a family member, you come to that place that they say, there's just no cure. Here's the reality, though, of what Jeremiah has been saying, what God has been saying through, through him. There is a cure. But at the height of their foolishness, they're rejecting the cure. Rejecting it so much that he said, why then is there no recovery for the health of the daughter of my people? There was a cure. Can you imagine that? There is a cure. Even in our day, there is a cure. How blind we are. How hard we are. How wicked, how depraved we are. When we know there's a cure. And we don't want anything to do with it. The, these prophets... And in these prophets, there's some hard things. There's some challenging things. And sometimes I know, and I think I've said this before, we look at these things and, 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 and all of a sudden our view of a gracious and merciful God sort of starts to change a little bit and we think, how mean He can be. Remember this though. All the time, the cure is right there. And they're so wicked, so depraved, they want nothing to do with it. You know what? Sometimes you've got to get a little mean to get people's attention. <laughs> when you've made it just as simple as you can, you've laid it there for all the world to see, and they still absolutely refuse. Something else, is it not? Well, 
We'll go over our prayer list and close with prayer tonight. First of all, those that are grieving, we've had quite a few of these. Uh, Carter family, the Collins family, the Joyce family, the Lawrence family, the Lawson family, Point family, Smith family, and the Thomas Stevens family, Tucker family, the Watkins family, uh, others that are sick or going through other difficulties, Vester and Barbara K. Atkins, Avery Ayers, Fran Ayers, Frankie Bowles, Steve Bowles, Sandy Brewer, Francis Byram, Benny Cardwell, Wanda Carter, Tommy Collins, Irvin and Ruth Cook, Rosemary Craycraft, Louise Dalton, Kelly Denny, Heather Dixon, Rhonda Durham, Kay Fry, Mitch Gwynn, Dorothy Harris, Kelly Harris, Jim Harris, Linda Harris, Connie Hawkins, David Hawkins, Luke Hayworth, Ruby Hayworth, Inez Hooker, Ralph Inman, Marcia Jones, Daisy Joyce, Reed Joyce, Robin Joyce, Lonnie Lemons, Melinda Lemons, Tori Lester, Dorothy Linville, Corey and Brantley Long, Annie Mae May, Bray May, Barbara Mannering, Reggie Manuel, Mike Marshall, Henry Martin, Teresa Martin, Joe Melvin, Clement Moore, Linda Moore, Peg Moorefield, Diane Nelson, Hazel Nelson, Angel Owens, Lynn Parr, Tim Price, Lena Pretty, Darren Roach, Woody Robertson, Devin Rogers, Carolyn Shelton, Ricky Shelton, Fred Smith, Annette Suther, Barbara Spencer, Betty Steele, Donald Stevens, Barbara Stevens, Janet Stevens, Brenda Stovall, Orel Stovall, Betty Tucker, Dementra Tucker, Pearl Monroe Tucker, Ricky Watkins, Tori Watkins, McCray Williams, Salem Williams, Twyla Williams, Bunny Wilson, Carol Wood, William Wood, our military, Jansen Clifton, Jordan Hodges, Brandon Pretty, Seth Scott, Logan Smith, David Stratton, Justin Vernon, Josh and Lacey Watkins, other things we're praying about, the lost, our leaders, our country, our world, our missionaries, and our church. Any others we need to add tonight? Any more to add? Any to remove? Okay. All right. Any others? All right, if not, let's close out with prayer tonight. Most gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for being our God. We thank you, Lord, for, uh, for being all you are to us and for doing all you have done for us. We know, Lord, that m- no more could have been done than what you have done for us. And we thank you for that and praise you for all you've given. We come before you tonight lifting these to you that are grieving. We ask your comfort on each of these families. Others that are going through surgery, recovering from various things, Lord, we just ask your blessings upon them. We do ask you to touch them with your healing hand. Work in their lives in a mighty way. We pray, Lord, for our military that you'd watch over them. We certainly think tonight of those who do not know you, Lord. And As we've talked about tonight, it's just remarkable that we could be so hard and so unwilling to turn to you when you've given so much. We just pray that you'd make it real to people, that Lord, in whatever means that you need to use, you'd make it real to people, that they might realize their need and turn to you in repentance before it's eternally too late. We remember our country, our world, a lot of difficulties and hardships around, threats and various things. Lord, we just pray that you'd be at work in the midst of all those things. We know that whatever happens, you're fulfilling your purposes moving things according to your plan. We praise you for that tonight. We pray for your church. Lord, you just use us to your honor, to your glory. And we thank you again for Jesus Christ, for what he did on Calvary's tree for us, and what we know he's yet going to do for us. And we ask this prayer in his name and for his sake. Amen. Good night and God bless.